how are derivatives related to differentials and what are they? How do they change when you go from one variable to many variables? To these questions and some other questions, I want to dedicate a series of videos. My first video will be about big O and small o notation, which is just an instrument that we are going to use later on. I would then look at differentials and derivatives in one variable, see how they get transported to many variables, or two variables in my case, and then we will discuss some examples and counterexamples of functions that prove or disprove certain theorems that we'll be proving in part two and three. So if you want to understand something specific from this list, then make sure you find the right part. So in this video, I'm going to proceed with big O and small o concept. We have two functions, uh, phi of x and xi of x, and we write that phi of x is equal to big O of xi of x for x more than a, if there exists a constant that we call a such that the absolute value of a function phi is always bounded above by the value of xi times this constant, right? And this holds for all x greater than a. Quite simple. So, a quick example, if you have a parabola, then you know that eventually it will grow faster than any straight line. So if you have a straight line here, you see that the parabola after a certain point will exceed the value of a linear function. And so we can pick the value of a to be any constant, and that is going to be true for all x after some point. We can also have that phi of x is equal to O small of xi of x. And this means that as x tends to some limit, a, by the way, a can be plus or minus infinity, we have that the limit of phi of x and psi of x is zero as x tends to a. Now, it's important to understand the big O and small o notation is heavily abused in mathematics. So I chose to define it like this in my video, but in different sources you might meet different definitions. For example, in big O, it might be defined not for all numbers greater than a, but for x tending to a, like here. It may also be defined for a limit, all right? But given my notation, it's a small exercise to show that if f is equal to little o of g, then it's also equal to big O of g. What is intuition for these terms? Well, with big O, we see that as x increases, phi of x is bounded by xi of x, but we allow equality. So in some sense, phi and xi are allowed to have the same rate of increase, the same order of increase. Well, in the case of small o, this limit 
tells us that as x tends to a, phi of x decreases faster than psi of x, thus giving us zero. So if f belongs to big O of g, then f and g grow at about the same rate. But if f belongs to little o of g, then f grows slower than, than g. Now to demonstrate this, we can actually use the same example. So let f of x be x, that will be a straight line at a 45 degree angle to the axis, and g of x be our parabola. And we'll be interested in a limit of x going to infinity. So what we get is x over x squared as x tends to infinity, which is just the limit of one over x. And of course, it's equal to zero. So you see, x grows at a much slower rate than x squared, so their ratio tends to zero, which is very intuitive. Let us now discuss some properties that big O and small o notation give us. The first one is the following. If we have a function that's double little o of f of x, then it's actually the same as single little o of f of x. When I just write little o of f of x, I mean any function that is equal to little o of f of x. Okay, so we want to show that the limit of this function over f of x as x tends to a and x tends to a for all of these is equal to zero. So how can I do it? Well, if I rewrite this fraction, what do I know about this function? Its function, this function is little o of this function, right? So I know that if I write little o of little o of f, let's reduce it down to this notation, and divide it by this function that's inside, this limit tends to zero, right? But these two fractions are not the same. I mean, I forgot f of x, but to make these fractions the same, I also have to multiply by little o of f again. And what do I get? If I take the limit as x tends to a, I know this guy tends to zero, but this function here is little o of f. So by definition, this fraction also goes to zero. So overall we get zero and we are done. I do recommend going through this yourself just to make sure you understand it with your own thinking. Now, as an exercise, I want you to prove that big O of big O of F is again just big F. This is quite easy because in some sense, if you bound the function twice, you can just multiply those constants and get a single big O. So this is quite easy. Let us now have concrete examples. I want to show that 
this polynomial function is actually a function of big O of x cubed. So once again, by definition, that means that beginning some x, this polynomial will be bounded above by x cubed times some constant. Well, consider this fraction. I just take my polynomial, divide it by x cubed, and then I just divide every term by x cubed. So I get 2 minus 3 over x plus 1 over x cubed, right? It's very easy to show that as x tends to infinity, all this tends to 2. But by the very definition of a limit as x tends to infinity, we know that for all x greater than some number n, we have that 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1 over x cubed minus the limit that it tends to is less than, say, 1. So here, I took epsilon equal to 1 in my definition of a convergent sequence. So just to stress, this number depends on epsilon, but I chose it to be 1, so it is some specific number. How does it help? Well, I can do something with this modulus. If I rewrite it, then I can use the inverse triangle inequality and claim this, bringing the absolute values onto my terms inside my big absolute value, if you like, but I still know it's bounded above by one, but if I delete this absolute value, the bound will still hold, right? Because the absolute value does not decrease a number. It can only increase the number. So that means that if I have 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1 over x cubed minus 2, and it's bounded above by 1, if I bring my constants to the right-hand side, I get it's bounded above by 3. And now, to satisfy my big O definition, I just multiply through by x. Remember that x is bigger than a number that's certainly not 0. And I get... 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1 is less than 3 mod x cubed, which is exactly what we need. So if you remember, in our definition for big O, our constant was labeled A, so here we have A equal to 3. Another exercise I want you to do is to demonstrate that this, fra this uh, bracket, sorry, can be written down like that. So this bracket, 1 plus x to the power n, is 1 plus n times x plus some function that decays faster than x. And I want you to do it for x that tends to 0. So as x tends to 0, only these ter two terms become significant. And a small hint is to use binomial theorem. 